Hello, Sawe, Anyang Haseo, Hola. <laughs> Welcome, friends, to this episode of Our Blooming Catholic Life with Deanna Williston. And today we're going to continue our talk on penance, the entire letter, the address of His Holiness Pope Francis to the participants in the general chapter of the Secular Franciscan Order has been translated now so we can read the official letter, not the news article. And honestly, I think the actual one is easier to read than the news article, which doesn't make any sense. Anyway, if you're looking for this online, I'll try and link it in the description below, but it's from the Vatican website. Use that title, Address of His Holiness Pope Francis, to the participants in the general chapter of the Secular Franciscan Order. It was given in Clementine Hall on Monday, the 15th of November, 2021. And underneath it, it says this little multimedia. If you click on that on the website, it's going to take you directly to um, a short abbreviated form of this but it's going to have a series of photos that were taken at the event. So if you'd like to see the photos, that's where they are. Um, and then, But then you have to click on the read more, which will take you to the main page. Okay, so let's read this translated version. And then today we're going to see what the, um, I have two books on the second edition of the catechism, ah, the compendium and the, what is this? Dark green version, they're both dark green. So we're going to try these two and see what they say about penance. Let's jump in. Dear brothers and sisters of the Franciscan secular order, good morning. I greet you with the words of St. Francis addressed to those he met along the way. The Lord give thee peace. I am pleased to welcome you on the occasion of your general chapter. In this context, I would like to recall some elements proper to your vocation and mission. Your vocation is born of the universal call to holiness. The Catechism of the Catholic Church reminds us that lay people share in Christ's priesthood ever more united with him. They exhibit the grace of baptism and confirmation in all dimensions of their personal, family, social, and ecclesial lives and fulfill the call to holiness addressed to all the baptized. Again, I did not know that when I picked the Catechism to address this next. I had only read the article. Uh, to continue. This holiness to which you are called as secular Franciscans, as the general constitutions and the rule approved by St. Paul VI asks of you, involves the conversion of the heart, attracted, conquered, and transformed by the one who is the only holy one, who is the good, every good, the supreme good, St. Francis, praises of the God Most High. This is what makes you true penitents. St. Francis, in his letter to all the faithful, presents doing penance as a path of conversion, a path of Christian life, a commitment to do the will and works of the Heavenly Father. In his testament, he describes his own process of conversion in these words, which you know well. The Lord gave to me, Brother Francis, thus to begin to do penance. From when I was in sin, it seemed to me very bitter to see lepers. And when I left them, that which had seemed to me bitter was changed for me into sweetness of body and soul. And afterwards, I remained a little, and I left the world. I don't see any end quotes there, but that, that's where it ends. Um, and that's lines one to three of the Testament, I guess. The process of conversion is thus. God takes the initiative. The Lord gave me to begin to do penance. God leads the penitent to places where he never would have wanted to go. God led me among them, the lepers. The penitent responds by accepting to place himself at the service of others and by using mercy with them, and the result is happiness. That which seemed to me bitter was changed into sweetness of mind and body, exactly the path of conversion taken by Francis. Mm, okay. <laughs> this dear brothers and sisters is what I urge you to achieve in your lives and in your mission. And please let us not confuse doing penance with works of penance. These fasting, almsgiving, and mortification are consequences of the decision to open one's heart to God. Open your heart to God. To open one's heart to Christ, living in the midst of ordinary people, in the style of St. Francis, just as Francis was a mirror of Christ, so you too might become mirrors of Christ. And if you're wondering, Mirrors of Christ is actually St. Clair, not St. Francis. 
you are men and women committed to living in the world according to the Franciscan charism, a charism that consists essentially in observing the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The vocation of the secular Franciscan is to live the gospel in the world in the style of the Pavarello sine glossa, to take the gospel as the form and rule of life. I urge you to embrace the gospel as you embrace Jesus. Let the gospel, that is, Jesus himself, shape your life. In this way, you will take on poverty, minority, and simplicity as your distinguishing marks before all. With this Franciscan and secular identity of yours, you are part of the outbound church. Your favorite place is to be in the midst of the people, and there, as lay people, celibate or married, priests and bishops, each according to his or her specific vocation, to bear witness to Jesus with a simple life, without pretension, always content to follow the poor and crucified Christ, as did St. Francis and so many men and women of your order. I encourage you, too, to go out to the peripheries, the existential peripheries of today, and there to make the word of the gospel resound. Do not forget the poor who are the flesh of Christ. You are called to proclaim the good news to them, referencing Luke 4.18, as did, among others, St. Elizabeth of Hungary, whose feast day it is today when I'm filming, your patroness. And just as the fraternities of penitents of yesteryear distinguished themselves by founding hospitals, dispensaries, soup kitchens, and other works of genuine social charity, so today the Spirit sends you to exercise the same charity with the creativity required by the new forms of poverty. May your secularity be full of closeness, compassion, and tenderness. And may you be men and women of hope, committed to living it and also to organizing it, translating it into real everyday situations and human relations in social and political engagement, nurturing hope in tomorrow by alleviating the pain of today. And, dear brothers and sisters, you are called to live this in fraternity, aware that you are part of the great Franciscan family. In this regard, I remind you of Francis's desire that the entire family remain united, certainly with respect for the diversity and autonomy of its various components and also of each member, but always in a lively mutual communion to dream together in a world in which we are all and all feel that we are brothers and working together to build it. Referencing the encyclical letter for Telly 2D number eight. Men and women who fight for justice and who work for integral ecology, collaborating in missionary projects and making yourselves artisans of peace and witnesses to the Beatitudes. In this way, we started out with the path of conversion and then all these proposals of fruitfulness that come from the heart joined to the Lord and that loves poverty. May St. Francis and all the saints of the Franciscan family accompany you on your journey. May the Lord bless you and may Our Lady, Virgin Maid Church, protect you. And please do not forget to pray for me. Thank you. Um, I do have different points here with, with the entire um, letter, of course. Uh, we still greet each other. We say peace and all good more than we say the Lord give thee peace. Um, St. Francis, when he does say in his testament about, you know, the Lord gave me brother Francis thus to begin to do penance. For when I was in sin, it seemed very bitter to me to see lepers. I will contend that again and again, every time people downplay the role of St. Francis physically building, uh, restoring the church that he was in, like the manual labor of going and getting the rocks. I mean, first he spent tons of time alone. Both he suffered at, he's, he suffered in a prison in a war, right? Uh, he's a prisoner of war. He suffered that way and became ill. He suffered at the hands of his parents who locked him up for a time when he was trying to, um, he'd gone back to war again, you know, and come back again. He tried multiple times. So for a time, he was locked up as a prisoner of war. He was a prisoner of his father for a while. He was a prisoner of his own mind for a while that um, possibly had some PTSD from his time in the war. And he would tend to go off to caves to pray as well. And so that came first. All of that began his conversion. And there were dreams in which God spoke to him as well along that journey. So he was already having some experiences of prayer first. And then um, when the Lord spoke to him from the crucifix and said, rebuild my church, Francis took it quite literally and went out and got rocks. First, he sold a bunch of things that were really his father's um, to get money to rebuild it. Um, eventually he get that money back, but he still physically rebuilt 
um, several small little chapels, and that was a lot of hard manual labor. And I will say there is value in doing that kind of penance as well. So first he changed his prayer life. He opened his heart to God. He did a lot of soul searching, a lot of time alone, a lot of time in quiet, a lot of time in prayer, and he would have preferred to stay on that path. Um, St. Clair was like, no, no, you also need to go out into the world. But, and he did that physical labor, that physical penance. And then he had the community of the brotherhood. But some at some point in there, he did have that encounter with the leper. And he did do service to the lepers. He did that thing that was really challenging to him. I mean, first, there was a lot of dot, dot, dot in there, in between there, because there was talk of him first encountering that leper, that it was actually a mystical experience and it was Christ. So when he first... First, on his journey of conversion already, he was pretty far along by the time he met that leper on the road. And he was like, yeah, I got to do it. I got to do the hard thing. And he got down and, and like embraced the leper and he eventually did go and serve lepers in a leper hospital. Um, and, and that which seemed bitter to him was changed into sweetness and body and so on. I wouldn't say happiness. I would say joy. Happiness is very temporal, whereas joy is something that really changes you. I mean, it's a gift of the Lord. And then the Lord began, gave me to begin to do penance. And it does say, you know, God led me among the lepers. That was not the first thing the Lord did. So I'd say it's a process. I, I'm again going to stick to my prayer, sacrifice, and almsgiving. You can see those in St. Francis's journey. I, I'm okay with confusing doing penance with works of penance because I think they're so integrated. Although he says that that's, it's a, a consequence of the decision. I, yeah, but it's like faith and works. You really can't separate them. If you separate them, you know, faith without works is empty and works without faith is hollow. They need to be together. I, I don't think I could separate them. Um, another part that confuses me, it does say, you know, that our favorite place to be is out in the world. Mm, I'd rather be in an adoration chapel all day to be honest, but I am also in the world. You know, I have responsibilities. I have a life here and that's not my calling. My calling though is balanced in that and I need to spend a fair amount of time in prayer in the chapel. I'm kind of disappointed that he doesn't remind us of that because it's such a danger to spend so much of your time in social causes that you fail to go back and refresh with the Eucharist. And the Eucharist was one of St. Francis's chief things and I'm kind of disappointed that that's not in here. Was the Eucharist mentioned at all? I, I don't hear it. So I don't hear about that going back. I don't hear about that faith. I don't hear about church is not mentioned until the end in its Our Lady Virgin Maid Church. So it's a little odd to me that that's not there. Franciscan family, we very much love to be a family, but we love to be different. We acknowledge there are so many different ways of living the Franciscan Charism, even among the third order. The third order is probably the ridiculously biggest because some people did end up going back and wanting to live in convents and monasteries and friaries. And yet, so we get the third order regular, both men and women, but there's many other groups. And that's where groups, like if there was a group of Anglican friars who, who converted, oftentimes will fall into our third order as well. So there's many, many, I mean, oh my goodness, so many in the Franciscan family. And we do have each our own slightly different charism. Um, there's one order of friars up in upstate New York that really deals with people suffering from addiction and helping them get back on their feet. And they are one of those groups that converted from another Christian faith tradition. Um, and that's lovely. And then there's some that are really devoted to operating homeless shelters. There are some that are really devoted to helping people get out of human trafficking right now. Um, when he talks about the existential peripheries of today, I have no idea what exactly what he's saying because then he says, do not forget the poor. Like they're two separate things. And the creativity required by new forms of poverty. Again, I'm not sure exactly what he's saying there. But... I promised you the catechism. And he did mention the catechism briefly. Um, I don't think he went into the numbers. So if you are looking for penance and conversion, that is on page 359 of the big book. If you have a smaller edition, no problem. Um, I know there's other smaller editions of this. It is numbers 1427 is where it starts. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read out of this um, for a little bit. It's just, it's just, 
um, page 359 and 360. So Jesus calls to conversion. This call is an essential part of the proclamation of the kingdom. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In the church's preaching, this call is addressed first to those who do not yet know Christ and his gospel. Also, baptism is the principal place for the first and fundamental conversion. It is by faith in the gospel and by baptism that one renounces evil and gains salvation. That is, the forgiveness of all sins and the gift of new life. 1428. Christ's call to conversion continues to resound in the lives of Christians. This second conversion is an uninterrupted task for the whole church, who clasping sinners to her bosom is at once holy and always in need of purification and follows constantly the path of penance and renewal. This endeavor of conversion is not just a human work. It is the movement of a contrite heart, drawn and moved by grace to respond to the merciful love of God who loved us first. I love that because it's bringing in that penance and conversion are not solely a human act, that God is involved in his grace. It is him moving our heart first. Um, We have the option to respond to it or not, free will, but he does start that opening. And you see that in the Bible all the time. You know, the heart was hard. God hardened his heart or God softened his heart. So God does that opening work, but we don't have to respond to it. So it does talk about it's the movement of a contrite heart drawn and moved by grace to respond to the merciful love of God who loved us first. All of these, of course, have footnotes that refer you back to scripture and the church fathers. I'm not going to give you those here. Get them and look them up yourself. The next, oh, 1429, St. Peter's conversion after he had denied his master three times bears witness to this. Jesus' look of infinite mercy drew tears of repentance from Peter, and after the Lord's resurrection, a threefold affirmation of love for him. The second conversion also has a communitarian dimension, as is clear in the Lord's call to the whole church, repent. St. Ambrose says of these two conversions that, in the church, there are water and tears, the water of baptism and the tears of repentance. That is so powerful, right? Powerful. Um, a lot of people think that that's what happens. Kind of, You have baptism and you have confirmation, which confirms you, but that's you giving your, your assent to the Holy Spirit to come in and begin this work. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get those tears, but we all know you, you have that experience. I always thought confirmation, that was it, but there was definitely a time in my life when it, when it became real to me. Um, and not that I didn't believe in confirmation. It was a big deal. I studied for, what, three years to do it. Like, it was a big deal. Um, but it's not what I thought it was. And there was still more opportunity. So many times our youth think that's the end of your conversion. That's it. You've affirmed it. Bam. Done. Um, no. St. Ambrose is very right there. There are water and tears. The water of baptism and the tears of repentance. There's a definitely a deepening that happens to you. And you may have one significant one in your life and then a, a bunch more little ones. Some people continually have big ones. It looks different in everybody's life. So interior penance is section four in this section. Um, 1430. Jesus' call to conversion and penance, like that of the prophets before him, does not aim first at outward works, sackcloth and ashes, fasting and mortification, which is funny that that's calling that outward works, fasting and mortification, that that's outward works, but that's works on your body, but at the conversion of the heart, interior conversion. So when it's saying exterior, outward, that has to do with your body and interior conversion has to do with your heart. I don't know where works of justice come in, (laughs) and that's even more exterior. But without this, such penances remain sterile and false. However, interior conversion urges expression, visible signs, gestures, and works of penance. Let me read that again then. Without this, such penances remain sterile and false. However, interior conversion urges expression, visible signs, gestures, and work of penance. You can't separate them. It needs to start with the conversion of the heart, but those outward penances have to happen too. They are completely linked if it is real. Interior repentance, this is 1431. Interior repentance is a radical reorientation of our whole life, a return, a conversion to God with all our heart, 
an end of sin, a turning away from evil with repugnance toward the evil actions we have committed. At the same time, it entails the desire and resolution to change one's life. With the hope in God's mercy and trust in the help of His grace, this conversion of heart is accompanied by a salutary pain and sadness, which the fathers called anime cruciatus, affliction of spirit, and compunctio cordis, repentance of heart. 1432. The human heart is heavy and hardened. God must give man a new heart. Conversion is, first of all, a work of the grace of God who makes our hearts return to him. Again, let's read that. Conversion is, first of all, a work of the grace of God who makes our hearts return to him. It's, first of all, a work of God. <laughs> like, I can't say that enough. Sorry. We, we can't do it ourselves. We can't. You can want to do it yourself, but you're going to need help. You're going to need some grace. Restore us to thyself, O Lord, that we may be restored. You can pray that as a prayer. Restore us to thyself, O Lord, that we may be restored. And that comes from Lamentations. God gives us the strength to begin anew. It is in discovering the greatness of God's love that our heart is shaken by the horror and weight of sin and begins to fear offending God by sin and being separated from him. And remember we talked about that book by Ralph Martin on the fear of God, fear God and give him glory. Was it by Peter Herbeck or Ralph Martin? It's definitely Renewal Ministries. I have a book review on this channel. So it's speaking right to this. And I said it was a very Franciscan book. And here we go. Um, all right. God gives us the strength to begin anew. It, it is in discovering the greatness of God's love that our heart is shaken by the horror and weight of sin and begins to fear offending God by sin and being separated by him. The human heart is converted by looking upon him whom our sins have pierced. Let us fix our eyes on Christ's blood and understand how precious it is to it is to his Father. For poured out for our salvation, it has brought to the whole world the grace of repentance. Who's that from? 28 St. Clement of Rome. In 1433, since Easter, the Holy Spirit has proved the world wrong about sin, i.e. proved that the world has not believed in him whom the Father has sent, but the same Spirit who brings sin to light is also the consoler who gives the human heart grace for repentance and conversion. And then it goes on to the many forms of penance in Christian life. The first paragraph there is going to be the interior penance of the Christian can be expressed in many and various ways. Scripture and the fathers insist above all on three forms, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. And that is from Tobias and Matthew which expresses conversion in relation to oneself, to God, and to others. Alongside the radical purification brought about by baptism or martyrdom, they cite as means of obtaining forgiveness of sins, efforts at reconciliation with one's neighbor, tears of repentance, conver concern for the salvation of one's neighbor, the intercession of the saints, and the practice of charity, which covers a multitude of sins. Wow. Wow, this is very powerful, friends. Up to 1435, conversion is accomplished in daily life by gestures of reconciliation, concern for the poor, the exercise and defense of justice and right, by the admission of faults to one's brethren, fraternal correction, revision of life, examination of conscience, spiritual direction, acceptance of suffering, endurance of persecution for the sake of righteousness, taking up one's cross each day and following Jesus is the surest way of penance. 1436, Eucharist and Penance. Daily conversion and penance find their source and nourishment in the Eucharist. Aha! So, you know, I wasn't, it, it wasn't just me that, it's right here in the Catechism. Eucharist and Penance, number 1436. It's on page 361 if you're following along in the big book. Daily conversion and penance find their source and nourishment in the Eucharist. For in it is made present the sacrifice of Christ, which has reconciled us with God through the Eucharist, those who live from the life of Christ are fed and strengthened. It is a remedy to free us from our daily faults and to preserve us from mortal sins. And we'll also comment on that for just a second. Let's see where that quote comes from. That comes from 35, Council of Trent. But notice it says, it is a remedy to free us from our daily faults. Those are our venial sins. And to preserve us from mortal sins. It does not clear out your mortal sin. If you are in mortal sin, that's not going to clear that out. You're going to have to go get the sacrament of confession and penance for that. 
but the Eucharist is a remedy to free us from our daily faults and to preserve us from mortal sins. That teaching has been a little twisted that it's freeing us from all our, our faults and it's, it's a remedy for everyone. That's not the way that works. 1437, reading sacred scripture, praying the liturgy of the hours, and the Our Father. Every sincere act of worship or devotion revives the spirit of conversion and repentance within us and contributes to the forgiveness of our sins. We know secular Franciscans are called to pray the Liturgy of the Hours and read sacred scripture every day. Sacred scripture is in the Liturgy of the Hours, but you might need to read a little bit more right there. Reading the sacred scripture, praying the Liturgy of the Hours, and the Our Father. And it includes every sincere work of worship. But I believe in one of the older forms of the secular Franciscan rule, the third order rule. It included that if somehow you missed praying the liturgy of the hours or you had some issues with comprehension or reading, that you could instead pray 12 hour fathers. I've tried this practice a couple of times when I've had a difficulty, whether it was late at night or I was really upset or something and couldn't, it just couldn't read the liturgy of the hours. I've done the 12 hour fathers like, like you're like, it's just saying that our father 12 times. No, it's not. Try it sometime. It is mind blowing. It, it, it's an amazing, amazing practice. Um, so that is also considered a form of penance in Christian life. Let's see what's 1438. The seasons and days of penance in the course of the liturgical year. Lent in each Friday in memory of the death of the Lord. What? The Friday's still in there. Yeah, sarcasm there. Um, they took out Advent as a penitential time in here, but many Catholics still practice Advent as a penitential time. So the seasons and days of penance in the course of the liturgical year, Lent in each Friday in memory of the death of the Lord, are intense moments of the church's penitential practice. These times are particularly appropriate for spiritual exercises. Penitential liturgies, pilgrimage as signs of penance, voluntary self-denial such as fasting and almsgiving, and fraternal sharing, in parentheses, charitable and missionary works. So they are included. They are not the main focus. They are very integral, but they are not the main focus of penance. 1439. The process of conversion and repentance was described by Jesus in the parable of the prodigal son, the center of which is the merciful father. The fascination of illusory freedom, the abandonment of the father's house, the extreme misery in which the son finds himself after squandering his fortune, his deep humiliation at finding himself obliged to feed swine, and still worse, at wanting to feed on the husks the pigs ate, his reflection on all he has lost, his repentance and his decision to declare himself guilty before his father, the journey back, the father's generous welcome, the father's joy, all these are characteristic of the process of conversion. The beautiful robe, the ring, the festive banquet are all symbols of that new life, pure, worthy, and joyful of anyone who returns to God into the bosom of the family, which is the church. Only the heart of Christ, who knows the depths of the Father's love, could reveal to us the abyss of his mercy in so simple and beautiful a way. And the Catechism goes on to describe the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, which is a beautiful place to put it right after the story of the prodigal son. Now I am going to leave off there in the main catechism. I'm going to go to the compendium of the catechism of the Catholic Church and this is written by the USCCB. I think I've reviewed this before. Um, it does it in more of a question form. So let's see here. Question 300. This is on page 88 and it's going to be addressing these numbers 1430 to 1433 and 1490. What is interior penance? It is the movement of a contrite heart, and that comes from Psalm 51, drawn by the divine grace to respond to the merciful love of God. This entails sorrow for and abhorrence of sins committed, a firm purpose not to sin again in the future, and trust in the help of God. It is nourished by hope in divine mercy. Beautiful. Question 301. What forms does penance take in the Christian life? Penance can be expressed in many and various ways, but above all, in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. What? <laughs> so contradictory sometimes. And it's not saying, um, and Pope Francis did say you, you, you need to do them. I know I kind of threw his little letter here. Um, let me see if I can find that. Mm -hmm. It's on the first page. 
Ah, let us not confuse doing penance with works of penance. These fasting, almsgiving, and mortification are consequences of the decision to open one's heart to God. Open your heart to God. Um, and so, but here it says in the Compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, question 301, what form does penance take in the Christian life? Penance can be expressed in many and various ways, but above all in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. These and many other forms of penance can be practiced in daily life of a Christian, particularly during the time of Lent and on the penitential day of Friday. So what Pope Francis, he equates um, doing penance with interior penance. Uh, and then 301 seems to say, what does penance look like in the Christian life? The exterior penance, okay? So it's talking about the two different forms. And Pope Francis is saying the most important is the <laughs> First, he says interior penance is the most important, right? But then he's reminding us again and again about all these social causes um, and existential peripheries and, and new poverty. So it, it, it seems to be contradictory, but maybe he's trying to tell us that they're linked. I'm not sure. Um, oh, that's it. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then it goes on to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. So that's it. I, am, I mean, it's a bit confusing because Pope Francis says, no, no, it's about interior conversion, not about exterior penance. It's about interior penance, not exterior penance. But here's all these even more exterior penances that you should be doing. Like he's saying that they, prayer fasting, Fasting, almsgiving, and mortification, which I'm not sure why prayer isn't listed there. I, I can't think that that's a transcription. He doesn't really mention, mentions the gospel. I, I don't really feel like there's a lot of prayer or the Eucharist in here, which is odd to me. That's what's, I suppose it's really odd. He talks about fraternity. He talks about all these social justice causes. And he's like, mm, maybe hold off on that fasting, almsgiving, and mortification. That, 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 that I guess he's saying that when you do your social justice, like when you go out all day and plant trees, that's a form of mortification because it's a lot of physical labor. Like St. Francis and doing the rocks for rebuilding the church. So if he's saying that, I, I agree to him there to some extent as well. Um, it's odd then that he didn't make that connection with St. Francis when he was trying to. That sometimes, sometimes um, the charitable works that you're doing for your fellow man or for the earth are, are forms of almsgiving, mortification, and fasting. But sometimes they need to just be because they are. Does that make sense? Sometimes, like, St. Francis didn't rebuild the church so that people who lived in the area would have a nice church to go to. Not that that is an unworthy cause, but that's not why he did it. He did it because God asked and he didn't question him. So um, sometimes the prayer, the almsgiving, it, like you just need to do it because it needs, because God wants us to do it. God says, take care of widows and orphans. So do I do it out of love for them? Yes, but I do it firstly out of love for God. And he asked me to do that. Like, Honor your father and mother. Yeah, that's part of love your neighbor as yourself. But also God asked me to do it. I'm going to do it. Even when I don't feel it. Ah, maybe that's where I'm getting at there. You, you don't necessarily have to, to feel it to do it. You do it because God told you to do it. And I guess we go back to that talk we did last time with um, the Ten Commandments, right? The, the, the Jews got led out of, I guess, I guess they weren't Jews. Then. I don't know. The Israelites got led out of Egypt. Um, they had been under slavery. So yes, he was freeing them from slavery, but he didn't do it because he loved them, his neighbors, at, you know, his kinsmen as himself. He did it because God ordered him to do it. That, that, and it wasn't easy for him. He wasn't a good speaker. <laughs> he wasn't a good public speaker. It involved a long journey. There was a lot of humility in going back to Pharaoh. 
There's a lot of humility there, right? And it was a big risk for Moses to go back. He had run away for a reason. So there was humility, there was danger. Like, so that was all ways of mortification, but he didn't do it out of love for his neighbor. He did it out purely out of love for God. And did he love his kinsmen? Absolutely. Did he want to see them free? I can't imagine he didn't. But that's not what it was about. It was God said, I, God said, I need this. I need my people to be able to worship freely with me. I need them to be able to commune with me freely. Um, I don't want them falling into that heresy, you know, and I don't want them falling under the influence of those alien gods. Uh, I'm saving them for my own sake and to show my power. And sometimes it has to be about that. Do we want to, to love our neighbors ourselves? Yes. And should we do it? Yes. But when Jesus was asked, he said, what is the greatest commandment? It is love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, everything you have. That's the greatest commandment. And he didn't bring up the other one. And we're like, well, is there another one? And then he gave that answer. So we have to remember that. So I don't know why this letter doesn't include prayer and the Eucharist. I don't know. Where'd that go? I don't know where that went. I don't mean the papers. I mean, where did that go from the talk? It was a short talk. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's my problem with some of the ecumenical Franciscan groups. I know. I think we're related. But obedience to the chair of Peter and and to the Eucharist, the teaching of the real presence of the Eucharist were so foundational for Francis. It is hard for me to see... Franciscans and the other faith traditions. Um, they're, I, I suppose they have elements of it, but oh, the Eucharist, the love of our Lord in the Eucharist was just so central. It breaks my heart that they think they're following Francis. But sort of, it's sort of like this letter. Where is the Eucharist in it? It should be very central. Um, and maybe it was more that wasn't in the formal address. I don't know I wasn't there, but these are points that I'm giving to you because a lot of us that are, those of you who are watching this with me, you weren't there either. You don't know. And I feel like the Eucharist should have been highlighted and it wasn't. And the role of prayer in our lives was not highlighted. And that's a lot of what made me uncomfortable with the letter. Do we need to work on our interior penance as well as our exterior penance as well as our super exterior <laughs> Yes, we need to do all of them. I think they're all tied. And if you're not doing all of them, whatever piece you're doing, you're not doing it well. It's not going to work. I don't know. Put your com put your thoughts in the comments below. Again, we're next Friday, we're going to look at the thoughts of St. Francis on this very topic. We're going to dive into the early documents. I haven't done it yet. I just planned it. So I'm very excited. I looked in the index. I saw what was there and I'm very excited to dive into that. And the last one in this series, we are going to look at the Council of Trent on Penance. And it has a much bigger section on penance than it does the modern one. Again, Council of Trent was really written for priests to help them be more pastoral. And this one is written more for the general public of the church. So a different focus there. Um, that's it. Oh, I had a little prayer. I was going to read out of the Secular Franciscan Companion. I have a review out on this as well, I'm pretty sure. And this is on page 45, Prayers to Fulfill God's Will. And it cracks me up because number two under here is pretty much the prayer before the crucifix, but it's written a little differently. So, in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. O great God of glory, my Lord Jesus Christ, I entreat you, a light into the darkness of my mind. Give me the right faith, firm hope, and perfect charity. Help me learn to know you, O Lord, so well that in all things I may do everything in true keeping with thy holy will. Amen. In nomine Patrick's affiliate, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. God bless you, friends.